name's Josh. It's actually Josh Calderimus, but Josh is a lot easier. This is me on Twitter. That's me on GitHub. This is me as a Rails contributor. So, Sven, you're right. Contribute, I do, this is me. I look after some gems. I created a few, but I maintain a, a few as well. You might know MultiJSON, which is also part of the Rails stack. Um, Faraday Middleware and LinkedIn. I come from Wellington, New Zealand, but I live in Amsterdam. So I didn't travel all that way just for the Ukraine because that is a really long flight. Not that I don't care. It's just a really long flight. And I'm a part of the core team for Travis CI. So can everyone see all right? Am I standing in front of the stage? No. Yeah, fine. Cool. Thanks, Sven. And usually Sven and I present together. That's why I wear this shirt. That's why I grow this moustache. I will tell you right now, when I go home to my girlfriend and I, I arrive back in Amsterdam, if I have this moustache, these are her exact words. Oh, it's back. <laughs> she loves me, not the moustache, but I do it for Sven. <laughs> Usually Sven and I talk about rainbows and unicorns, you know, and love, but today it's just me. In fact, while I talk about Ray, uh, Travis Core, there's quite a few Travis Core people floating about here today. So, could you do me a favor and just stand up? We've got Michael, Fritz, uh, Sven. Yep, you're going to have to stand up again, Sven. Come on, all stand up. It's not that hard. Excellent. I haven't met you yet, Michael. Hi. <laughs> um, and we've also got a lot of contributors to Travis here. So, Vlad as well, but he's super busy. So before we get started and I talk about what my talk is actually about, I need you all to do me a favor. Please stand. Come on, please stand. Please stand, excellent. We'll get some blood going, especially as you've got this energy on the first day. Tomorrow when you're hungover, you're not gonna stand for me. So I want you to stay standing if you test your code. If you, if you test your code, stay standing. And don't be afraid to sit down. It's all right. We're not going to shame you. Okay, cool. Good start. Okay, stay standing if you do some open source software work. It could be a contribution. You could have a gem. You could, you know, help tutor someone. Okay? This is really good. I, guys, everyone look around and see these guys because this is really good. Okay. Stay standing if you test your code, work on open source software, and you use a CI server. And wait, wait, wait. And you don't use Travis, so I can just be clear about this. Okay. Okay. Now, for the people that are standing, please stay standing. <laughs> if you test your code, do open source software, CI server, and test against multiple rubies. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Well, Sorry, thank you, Guy. <laughs> oh, another one down here. <laughs> so that, that is what this, you can sit down now, you can rest. Don't worry, we'll give you a prize later. <laughs> That's what this talk is all about. I'm going to be talking about Travis CI, the distributed continuous integration system for the open source community. I want to talk about four topics today. There's the what, the why, the how, and the now. So to get started, what is Travis CI? So it's an open source, distributed, <laughs> it's pretty much the tagline really, continuous integration system, and it's for every open source community. It's not just Ruby, it's not Node, it's not C, it's everyone. We've got a lot of limitations at the moment, but the whole idea is it's for everyone. It started out as Ruby. So Sven, I'll give you a little bit of history. Sven started this in December 2010. 
Uh, he was coding away, did a couple of iterations. Uh, I happened to come across it in February, jumped on board. Uh, we had Fritz and Michael and Vlad and a whole other bump, a bunch of people, but it was only for Ruby at that stage. And now it's completely open source. So we'll get to this very shortly. But let's have a, a small look through it. So this might be a little bit uncomprehensible to everyone here, so if you have a computer, you're more than welcome to open it up and have a look. But we've got three main areas. We've got on the left-hand side the current or very recently tested repositories. So for example, Pry. If you've heard of Pry, it's a alternative to IRB. And you can see here that Pry tested itself against 187, 192, 193, Rubinius, JRuby, and Ruby Enterprise. We can even have a look through their tests and see everything passed. We can even have a look what is in the bundle, what was required to test it. Now, if something's building right now, you might see, yes. So for example, Blood Bank is building at the moment. It's got a couple of failures. And we can actually see it building live for us. So we do everything via WebSockets. You can see that we've got some workers. Uh, you can look through the history of a project as well. Tick, tick, tick. Come on, internet. Come on, unicorns, work for me. <laughs> and this is where the internet stops working for me. It's like the live demo gods have spoken. So my computer just keeps sliding down. Is that an omen as well? There we go. So we can actually look at, through the build history of a project and see where it passed and failed. We can look through what commit it was, go to GitHub, and see the exact change set that, um, that caused the failure. This is a full integration, a continuous integration server. So since the internet's working a bit slow for me, I might just go away from that for now. There. So why did we build Travis, though? It's not like there aren't alternatives. Why really has a couple of meanings. So if we look at the why for a second, there's Jenkins, we've got CI Joe, we've got Integrity, we've got Cruise Control. But it's all kind of meh to us. Uh, it's not that you can't get Ruby projects to work on these, but there are two things to consider. Is it easy? And do you really want to set up a CI server for your open source projects? So what we really wanted was something that was open, it was distributed, it was you know, instant, it was live, and it also gave us a chance to learn about the subject matter, because when you install something like Jenkins, you're not getting involved in the code, you're not learning the intricacies of continuous integration. Travis gave us the opportunity to really learn the subject matter. So it was kind of, you could regard it as a hobby as well. Although I wouldn't tell my friends that. My hobby is continuous integration, and I like biking. So we wanted something modern and hackable and fun, and Travis is everything and this and more. So we really thought that Travis should be for builds what Ruby Gems is for Gems. We wanted it to be this one source where you could go to see results, and to do the testing and just be a piece of infrastructure. It's not just a project, it's not, uh, for example, Refinery CMS. This is a project that you would use. We want this to be a really core part of what we do as developers. But if we think for a second here, why do we need Travis? If you go to your console and you type this, you do a new Rails test app, then you go bundle and store, you are likely to see this. Now, it's a lot of gems, 42 in total. And a lot of gems isn't bad. A lot of gems, you know, gems are, are there for a reason where we abstract out a piece of functionality that is reused time and time again. The trouble is that do we know that all of these gems are 
tested against your environment and your realistic environment that you're running in a day to day. And we need to consider for a second, what are the differences in the environments? For example, we might have different databases. We might have different versions of a gem running. We might have different rubies. And what we want to know is if these gems on a day-to-day -day basis are tested against all of these variabilities. So usually when people set up a CI server, they will set it up for one Ruby, one database. They will take the happy path. And we want to make it easy that you can test against all these variabilities. So we talked about the why do you need Travis, but who needs Travis? And there are kind of two people. There's library developers, the people that are creating these gems, these frameworks. But there's also library users. Library developers want their code tested. Library users want to know that it, the code that they're using is tested. So, you know, by making testing easy for library developers, we can instill confidence in library users that it will work for them. And that's really important. I'm creating an app for um, an events website. I don't want a time, date, you know, some form of gem that I'm using to go wrong and tell people to turn up at the club two hours early by accident. You need to test against variabilities and make it work for everyone. And even worse is, you know, you're working hard late at night, you're all just, you're racked over this problem. Does this seem, no, no one's not even like, looking at this going, this is weird, this is children, I, I'm calling you, uh, anyhow. You're working late at night, and then suddenly <laughs> you get a bug. And what you really don't want to be doing is like, it's fine if that bug is in your code, but you don't want to then chase that white rabbit down <laughs> someone else's code. Because code can sometimes be crazy. Although I do always think as a good measure, if you're gonna use a gem in a project, no matter what it is, read the code first. You don't need to understand everything. Read it and make sure it's not doing something really whack. Because if it's doing something really crazy, it's a warning sign. But you don't want to chase that white rabbit down someone else's code. But, really the end goal is, Travis, is higher quality code. For you and for, well, for the developer and for the library user. And also to, to make the world a better place. And have any, has anyone seen these little buttons around floating on GitHub? Yeah. yeah? Those come direct from Travis. So we can hook that up and we can tell people while you're looking at GitHub what is going on with that library. We can say, yay, it's all passing, you're free to use it. If it's red, you might want to check the failures and to see what the failure is about. Maybe it's heavily under development at the moment, so maybe a failure is all right, but it's a warning sign. So let's talk about the how a little bit. We've talked about all the fuzzy warm bits, why, how it makes it good, all the rainbows and unicorns. How do we actually make this happen? This is a really simplified look of Travis. We get, if we, if we walk through the flow a little bit, it starts up at GitHub, you're working on your code and you commit, and GitHub sends us to the web app where we host it on Heroku saying, you've just pushed your code. And what we do, is over here, uh, we haven't quite put it, but we have a little Redis queue, we use Rescue, and it goes to Rescue and the worker pulls it and says, oh, I'm gonna start working on that job, and it does the script and it does the build, and then it pushes all the updates as they happen live to Heroku via HTTP post. And we'll get to that in a second, because that's horrendously inefficient. If you have one dot update, you need this big envelope. And it comes up to Heroku, and Heroku sends it to Pusher, and then Pusher sends it to the browser to do the live update. I mean, this is pretty much it. And it works really well for the most part. But I really want to talk about the worker. This is the part I am most proud of. We have worked really hard at this. Michael, Sven, I, a whole other bunch of developers and just getting this flow right. And it's really tricky because if we think about it for a second, this is a standard CI setup. If you install Jenkins or CI, um, CI Joe Integrity, this is the standard setup. It's not saying that this is the only setup, but this is what you usually get out of the box. Your web app is your worker 
and it runs your tests all on the same machine. On top of that, it's running it on the, on the same machine and not cleaning up after itself all the time. You can't, be sh you can't expect a CI system to clean up for you a lot of the time. So the first thing that we did is when we talked about distributed, you need to start separating some of the components. So the web app itself became its own separated app which is deployed to Heroku. And the worker which runs the test, that's on a dedicated box. And this was good. This was a really good start. The trouble is that it's also inefficient. We've got this dedicated box running these tests and it can only run one test at a time reliably. So the next part we did is we moved all of those tests into a VM. We use VirtualBox and Vagrant, and now we've got this, you know, we can host four to five running tests at one time on a dedicated box. And this is really good. This is a, a much better use of resources, but it's got a big inherent problem. It's not sandboxed. What you want to make sure is, especially in open source code, where I'm committing, and Sven's committing, and John's committing, and everyone's committing their projects, and they're all being tested by the same worker. You don't want John's code to affect my code, and my code to affect Sven's code. You need a sandbox. You need this clean test environment. So if we think about, again, CI Joe, integrity, Hudson, Jenkins, or Jenkins now, the default setup won't do the clean environment for you. Our default setup is VirtualBox. And because of that, we use the power of what's called snapshotting and now immutable disks. So this means that whenever we power down the machine and power it back up, we have got a clean environment from the get-go. It doesn't matter what you do to that hard drive, to that virtual machine, you can delete every single file and start running a bot on our server. And after 20 minutes, we're gonna shut it down and throw it away and no one's gonna know. Although that's kind of, me <laughs> now you all know you can run bots for 20 minutes. Um, so the important thing is that we are making sure that your code is not gonna affect your neighbor's code or the person in front of you or the person behind. But our next big thing, <coughs> pardon me, I'm just getting over a cold. The next big thing that we're working on, it's not complete, is this, the big red box. This big red box is going to be JRuby. We currently use MRI for everything, and JRuby is, do many people know JRuby? That's good, yeah. JRuby is fantastic, it runs on the JVM, it's a Ruby implementation that's built on top of the JVM. You get all of these fantastic things that are built into the JVM, I'm not saying I'm a Java lover, I do like a lot of the maturity in Java, but we get a lot of things that you get from the stability of the VM. And one of them, I, I didn't make up a slide, but one of them is called Visual VM, you should look into it. It allows you to see everything from the current memory usage, the garbage collection, you can even trigger a garbage collection live on a GUI and see how it affects the machine. You can see how much CPU is being used, how much memory, it's fantastic, but nonetheless we use JRuby, because now what we can do is we can have a thread communicate with each VM. And then afterwards, it throws away the VM and you get a new one afterwards. It's, it's really great because we've got one process instead of five now. We've got one process which we can ask, what is going on? What is your state? We haven't quite finished this. We're three or four weeks through development and that's a long time and we've probably got another two weeks. It's on staging, it's working really well. This is where we see it going next. But I, I also wanna talk about the build. The infrastructure is interesting, but I think the build is also quite interesting because we abstracted away a lot of when you're doing a build. Now if you think about, again, a standard CI system is based on you have shell access, these are the scripts to run. Please run bundle install, please do this. You have to say what you want it to do, instead of it just knowing. And we kind of broke that up a bit. We kind of saw three parts out of a test. There's the setup, the install, 
and then actually building the tests. What we, we call it building tests, but we're kind of running scripts, like we're calling RSpec or we're calling test unit. But these are the three things that a standard build is doing. And if we look at a Ruby build, a Ruby build is doing setting up environment variables, it's doing the git clone, it's doing the RVM use. These are all setups. And then it goes into, what did I call it, the install. And bundle install is our stock standard way. And what we do is we're a little bit smart. We go, is there a gem file? Yes, there is. Bundle install. If there's no gem file, we're not going to do it. And on top of that, you can even overwrite it and say, for install, please run isolate. Please run gem install blah. Please run this shell script. You are completely free to overwrite anything but we try to take some basics for you. And then we go bundle exec rake, and we'll only get, use bundle exec if there's a gem file. But what about other languages? If you look at an Erlang build, they've got their own way of doing setup and running um, scripts by default. So if you define that your project is an Erlang project, then we can actually figure out what needs to be done for you. The greatest thing about this is that we can now create a little DSL in what we call the Travis YAML. We can say, define RVM and give us an array of Ruby versions. It makes it easier for you as a developer to figure out how to create this matrix. We do it for you. So we've talked about the how and how it all works and why. I want to talk about the now a little bit, just to let you know where Travis is. Right now, we test 2,200 open source projects daily. Well, not, you know, daily. We have them set up. But on a daily basis, we run between 1,000 to 2,000 builds a day. I mean, that's a lot. A, a CI server, the open source community running 1,500 builds, I think is pretty impressive. We handle 43,000 commits in total. That's what we've hand, handled from GitHub. And out of that, 164,000 builds. From Rails alone, we're the official CI server for Rails, we handle, or we have handled 1,100 builds from them. And they build against two rubies, and they have split up their tests. So that's 1,000 pushes, and it equals about 10,000 builds. It's, it's a lot. We're official CI for Rubinius, for rubygems.org, and for Bundler. And for me, these are the core pieces of Ruby infrastructure that we can show you and tell you right now what is Bundler tested against. And I can tell you right now, it's not tested against Rubinius or JRuby. It's te tested against 187 and 192 and 193. This is good. It's also bad. We need to do better as a community. We need to make sure our gems are tested against different variabilities, for example, Rubinius and JRuby. So if I use JRuby, I know that Bundler works for me. We also test all of these other open source projects that you might have heard of. I, I really like, we've got the JSON gem, Mongoid, Yard, Refinery, CMS, Koala, OAuth2. Everything's up there. Go have a look. And we currently support Erlang, Clojure, and Node.js. And very soon, we hope to support Python, PHP, and Cocoa. And I think that will be huge for us. Cocoa is going to be an interesting one because this is using Xcode. It's only for Mac. And it means that we're going to have to do some really crazy shit. And I'm going to need Michael's help a lot. But Python and PHP is an interesting one because PHP, who, who here is a PHP developer as well? Do you guys actually test? <laughs> I guess we're not going to become very popular. Um, I hope we're going to push you to test more. I think Python will be quite popular, but now we need to learn how to get all the Pythons installed. So what is the future for Travis, though? AMQP for the win. This is absolutely brilliant. I showed you this before. This is really inefficient horrendously. And that's inefficient because, as I said, if we send two dots to say two tests have passed, 
here is your HTTP envelope. It is ridiculous. It has to go through the whole web stack. AMQP simplifies this. We have it go to a reporter. It does the processing. It's a very small payload. It's JSON. It just works. And we've already tested it on staging, and it works a charm. Few issues to sort out, but that is going to be a godsend, because from now on, we can keep this graph, which is nice and simplified, but we actually have what's called an AMQP broker about here. And what Heroku will do, it will say, you've got a new job. And it goes to the broker, and then the broker talks to the workers. And what you can also do is it means that while the workers are working, we can take the reporter offline and fix something about it, and all the messages will queue up. The broker will keep those messages, and if we fix the broker, oh sorry, fix the reporter, bring it back online, it just processes all the jobs. We don't lose data, we don't, uh, we become a lot more stable for you, and it reduces what we need to do to maintain all of this. So that's gonna be huge, and I've, we've gotta give a big thank you to Michael for pushing us towards this, yeah. Okay. That also brings me to the JRuby worker that we we're talking about. JRuby is a godsend as well for our worker, I think. Um, it's given us the stability of the VirtualBox API, which it's got a great Java library. Also, there's a library that we're using called HotBunnies for AMQP. And that takes advantage of the Java executable and runnables. Sorry, pardon me. <coughs> Sit down. <laughs> and the JRuby worker is, um, it's gonna bring a lot more stability for us, especially with the AMQP side, where, as I was saying, it, it does this runnables, so it knows how to use Java to uh, use threaded programming, and we can make sure everything's running smoothly. I, I, I love JRuby now, I've fallen in love with it. It's not as daunting as it seems. There are a few things that you'll need to learn and work around, but gems work with it other code works with it, your Ruby code, and it allows you to now write Java in a much more sane way. We're working on a mobile client as well. Who here has uh, ever seen that big green merge button on GitHub? Okay, the biggest problem is, and I, this happens from John and mostly Jose, but it happens from Rails Core a lot. Someone does a pull request, and they see the big green merge button, and they just can't keep their finger away from it and they're on their mobile phone and they're like, do I push it? Do I? And they just push it, and then the tests fail. And then what they have to do is they have to go and they have to revert everything. That big green merge button is a bad thing, but it doesn't also allow them to see the tests passing or failing for Travis. So it actually kind of brings me to the next one. Well, actually a couple of ways, so I'll go to the next one. But the big green merge button we're, we're trying to fix with a mobile client and what I'll talk about shortly. The next part is VM abstraction. We use VirtualBox a lot, and VirtualBox is great. It's really, well, Sven is probably smirking at me when I say it's great. I'm, I'm on stage, so I don't want to say negative things. VirtualBox is a bitch, and it's great at the same time. It is an absolute bitch sometimes to get right. You know, you do one thing wrong. There is, a, there is actually an error mode called Guru Meditation. It's built into VirtualBox. You've got the GUI open. If we do something wrong when we're pausing a machine, it goes into guru meditation mode. What the fuck does that tell you? It, like the error docs actually say guru meditation mode is when something goes really wrong. And that's it. It's like that is the, the docs. The, the API docs are also a little bit insane and they're very not clear. So uh, VirtualBox is great for when you're doing a local deployment and when you're running open source where you've got people giving us boxes, but if you want to use something like EC2, we need to abstract the VM a little bit. And the VM abstraction will allow us to use EC2 or Brightbox or a whole number of different uh, cloud providers. And cloud providers, you know, when I talked about sandbox, cloud providers are sandboxed by default when you think about it. You start it up and it's fresh and clean, you shut it down, it's back to normal. There are some, you know, little variabilities in that, but EC2, that is the default setup. And that's great, because now we can just start up a VM, 
wait for it to start, and it's in a sandbox mode. Build artifacts, a great idea as well. Um, who here does Selenium testing? And you're doing local, yeah, that's great. Like, when you're doing local development Selenium tests, sometimes you want to take screenshots. And that's great, but if you're doing it on a CI server, if you take a screenshot, we're not gonna currently show it. The next part is that whatever files that you create maybe will specify a directory, we will upload those to Travis and you can maybe see them as a gallery. Here are all of the screenshots you took. And that's really great as well for Refinery or Rails admin, where now people can check the integration tests and they can see what happened in the image or images. And pull requests. This is major. I, I need to thank Rick Olson for this. I need to give him a big shout out. He worked really hard in adding the pull request support. Now, they did a blog post the other day about all the other things that you can now use with the Service Hook API. And pull requests is a big one for us because now, let's say your Rails core, you've got that big green merge button, a pull request comes in. Now Travis will test that pull request for Rails core. We will leave a comment to say if it passed or failed. And now you can use that big green merge button in safety and in happiness. And with that warm feeling inside that it, you're not gonna have to revert it afterwards. This will be big for open source. It's not just Rails, it's every open source project out there like Node and Django where we can now test it and tell you what happened or is going to happen if you merge it in. Thank you, Rick. I love you. I also want to just do one quick slide about all of our sponsors because everything about Travis is not a paid project. I don't sit and get paid for what I do here. In fact, Sven and I and, and Michael, we, we devote a lot of our time and energy um, after work. It's like a 14-hour day making sure Travis is running for everyone. And without these people here, this would not be possible. So a, a huge thank for you know, Postmark who sent all our emails and Engine Yard who help us test Rails and Heroku and Pusher and Enterprise Rails who were first on the bandwagon to, to donate us boxes and still donate the most. And Rails Love and Thorbot and GitHub. All these people, you know, if you've got a chance to use their products, try it out, they're really great. And I kind of come to the end of my talk where I give us how you can, I, I tell you how you can contact us. This is where you can reach us on GitHub and IRC and even on um, uh, dear old uh, Twitter. But IRC is the most important one. Michael, Sven and I are always there. Come and ask us a question. Get your project on it. Get someone else's project on it, even more importantly. I'm not gonna name names, but I will name the project which is kind of naming names. There is a gem called Mail by Mickle. Okay, I named names. The, the Mail gem, which is used with Rails, fails on some Rubik's. It's tested, the bugs were never fixed, it's failing on some Rubik's. You wanna get an open source contribution in? Find failing uh, gems and projects, fix the tests. Find out what's wrong. This is a perfect place to get involved in the community. Go to Travis. Find a project that's having issues and just start a pull request. Say, I can fix that issue. Don't fix the issue by removing the test. <laughs> fix the code. But you know, just jump on board and try and help other people out, even if you don't have a, your own project to put on there. Help make the world a better place. <laughs> and also, because you're awesome. I want to thank you very much for having me here. I want to thank Vlad for such a fantastic conference and, watch it, and, and a really fantastic venue. Um, and yeah, any questions? Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank you and thank the whole Travis team for this awesome project. Uh, come on, guys. <laughs> you are awesome. And uh, I have a couple of questions. First of all, uh, as I know, there is no way to uh, set up Travis on my open server for now, yeah? Are there any work in this direction? Uh, uh, that's, a, that, that's a good question. Um, 
So when Travis first started, it was one of those things you could install on your own computer. It was running the tests on that machine. You could run the web server and the work on one machine, and that's all it really required. But now Travis requires a lot. There's nothing stop. Well, it's not that there's nothing stopping you. It's just an absolute. Uh, sure. It's just a pain in the ass to get running. And there's no docs at the moment because it's not our priority. If you want to jump on board and help us, please. But the big thing is that what you've got to consider, you need RabbitMQ, Redis, Postgres. Uh, there's probably about three other services, WebSockets. By the time you actually install that, why don't you just use Jenkins? So it, it is, I'm not advocating Jenkins, but I am advocating that sometimes setting up a really complicated project that's probably really tuned for uh, distributed builds and for uh, the community might not be the best to run internally, but at the same time, if you want to make it easier and help us, I would love that. Anything, because we, we get this question a lot, and I'm sure there'll be a million people out there asking you the same, asking us the same questions and wanting to get it working. Uh, okay, and uh, there is one other question. Uh, do you plan to support uh, private repositories from GitHub? No, well, we have a you, repository. You just asked the two most asked questions. <laughs> uh, we have one, and uh, we can we cannot now test it so using Travis. You, you've got a good question. Like you could do this by running it internally yourself, or we are running a cruise control. But yeah, so I don't think it's I don't think it's a secret to say that Sven and Michael and Fritz and I have all been talking about. What is the next step? I love working on Travis. I, you know, I do this open source as well as a job. And when only your mind is thinking about the stuff that you love, you need to start thinking about how you can make that a day job. And we've been talking about maybe setting up a beta for private repos so companies like yourself could try it out and we can try it out and see if it works in the community. And maybe we can offer a hosted CI service so you get all the benefits of Travis, except you don't have to look after the, the CI service yourself. So that's what we're thinking, but we're not there yet. All I can say is watch this space, email us, hang an IRC, keep nagging us, and we'll let you know. Uh, I have a question about security. You show uh, one virtual box and running uh, for uh, workers and they share the same environment. What? Well, they, they don't share the same environment. Each worker is running its own worker code. Like it's it's also running its own hard drive. It's completely separated from the other workers. So it means that whenever you change in one worker, it doesn't affect the other workers. They're all individual workers. They're actually five virtual machines running individually. So. So it's. Uh block it's virtual machine uh, it's, well, it's one dedicated box okay with it's... five virtual machines in it I see and at the moment it's also five Ruby rescue processes you know connecting to one virtual machine it's like they're tightly coupled oh. and very soon you're gonna have J Ruby talking to five VMs individually okay so whatever the case is it doesn't matter what you do in your code it's not going to affect anyone else's code and it's completely sandboxed and we roll back. Te technically, uh, what's it's virtual box. Every worker is distinct virtual box. Sorry, can you say that again? Um, I mean, worker place it in which uh, box? Uh, it's virtual box or it's some well, jailing or what? Uh, virtual box is by Sun, but now owned by Oracle. So virtual box is the product that we use. Um, and so it's this worker, I, I ask it uh, how this worker is, uh, uh, which technology you use to, um, to run this process uh, in different environments. Oh, so um, we, we run everything on Linux and we run all the virtual boxes in headless mode. So it allows us to run five virtual box virtual machines at the same time. I see, okay. Um, and that's why the idea of the, the virtual machine abstraction and allowing you to maybe say, let's use EC2 will make it easier. Because, because when we think about it, the one thing I didn't cover is if you think about how we run our tests in the virtual machines, it all comes down to SSH. If I just go back a couple, sorry. <whistles> 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 
here. This one here. This here, JRuby, is talking via SSH. The only thing that we need to do is be able to tell this VM how to start and stop. So abstracting that out actually isn't too difficult. It just means that even if it was up here and it's EC2, we just need to talk via SSH. And then we need to be able to tell it to shut down or start up. So it, it leaves us a lot of room. Can, can it be jailbreaked? Sorry? <laughs> I mean, can it be jailbreaked? Because you talk to these uh, machines uh, uh, from JRuby and... Well, if you like, after the presentation, I can go okay. through some and, of it. With and you. another question. Uh, yeah. you, you said you, uh, you want to switch from Redis to AMQP, yeah? We think we're still going to keep Redis for some things. We still need background jobs for part of what we're doing. It's just that AMQP allows us a much more effective mechanism for talking to the workers and for relaying job messages. Okay, uh, I will ask you later. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm walking. Uh, I'm working on. Uh, Raspberry's Ruby client, and uh, some some of my tests uh, depend on uh, running cluster or Raspberry's cluster. Is it possible to test uh, my client uh, with a custom environment? For example, I need to uh, configure the cluster. Also, I need to be ensure that uh, my client will work uh, on different operation system. For example, on uh, RPM based, uh, uh, maybe uh, Windows. Right, right now, everything that you're testing is going to be in Linux, but we provide every database under the sun. We provide, um, you know, full access to the machine. You can install any library you want, but you're only going to have use of one VM. So if you're going to test something and you need to set up, you know, some system libraries, you've got passwordless sudo access, so you can go apt get install my crazy library. You can do whatever you want to that machine for testing, and then we're just going to have some time limits and you know, throw you out afterwards. But if you want to show me some of your setup <laughs> later, uh, grab Sven and I, and we can go through what we can do to get it up and running. Okay, thank you. Um, the first question is, uh, we can uh, do uh, some continuous integration using uh, make as a rake. Uh, is it possible to use uh, uh, other uh, make systems like uh, Ant, Maven? And um, the, the second question, how many service, uh, servers uh, used uh, by Travis uh, for distribution? Sorry, um, so what was the second question again? How many servers uh, um, uh, you are using for distribution? So Travis tests itself, but on top of that we use, um, we use six workers, each running five virtual machines in it. Each of those workers are currently provisioned for different uh, open source needs. For example, we've got three Ruby workers, We've got two Rails workers, because a Rails build in itself is actually really interesting. Uh, before Travis helped out, a Rails build took two hours just for 192. So you know, imagine your Rails core, and you're committing, and you're uh, merging in a pull request. You have to wait two hours to know if it fails. And that's just ridiculous. It, like, the feedback loop is way too long. And that was just one Ruby. So what we've done is we've broken it up, uh, spent a lot of hard work on this and, and getting it just right, and we can now get that down to 40 minutes. And we hope to keep it that or get it lower after we keep adding more rubies like JRuby and Rubinius. On top of that, we've got an Erlang worker, so, you know, and we're going to add a node worker as well. So we're going to have a lot of computing, but at the same time, it's a little bit inefficient because we've also got a lot of computing sometimes just sitting there doing nothing our carbon credits going through the roof. We have to plant a lot of trees. Um, the first question again, sorry, my, my mind is like a goldfish. What was the first question? Uh, we can use a rake for build yep. uh, projects. You can, you can use whatever you like. We've got Java, Maven, 
you can use rake, you can use shell commands, you can run whatever you need to run, and if there is something that you need to run that you can't, talk to us and we can get it running. It, it really is a, as simple as that. If you need something that we don't have, we can tell you how to get it up and running. We can even try and get it on the VMs so you don't have to do anything. Just tell us and let us help you out. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have sudo access, right? Yes. Can we mine bitcoins in there? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Can we mine bitcoins there? I can't, I can't quite hear. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you've got you've got 20 minutes to mine bitcoins, and then we'll we'll shut you out, and then you can come back in and mine another 20 minutes worth of bitcoins. Yeah. I remember we're at Yoroku, and Sven and I had just given a presentation, and it was in our really early days, and someone did a tweet to say, "Oh my God, look, I just hacked Travis," and he put this gist up of how he did it, and we tweeted back, going, "Thanks for letting us know, but we kind of told everyone how to do that as well." The, the truth is, our old days, we were really insecure. Our new days were a lot more, but we do rely a little bit on the community playing nice because otherwise we're gonna have to start doing some um, things that we don't want to do, like turning off net access so you can't um, do HTTP requests. Because if your gem for some reason needs to do an integration test with an API, we allow that at the moment. but it requires the community to play nice. But at the same time, if you want to mine bitcoins, go for gold, and then we're gonna shut it down for everyone. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, in some projects, there are very complicated test suits, like Rails, and uh, the build can stay red for days, at least. Yep. And uh, your uh, pull request testing feature should be should somehow cover that and provide some kind of analytics for people to know who did that. Well, we, we provide emails, IRC, and webhooks. The trouble is, if people turn that off, uh, we can't do much about that. We have had one person complain that we have it turned on by default. We're we're not going to change that. There's no way we're we're going to change that because if we don't tell people by default that their tests are failing, then I think it's a broken system. It's kind of like saying, you can test it and make everyone think you're testing it, but you're never gonna know what's wrong until someone tells you. And we're trying to tell people. So we do have some mechanisms built in by default. Okay, and uh, do you have a, a, a way to track where does the <coughs> problem appear? Is that either your pull request or is it in the master branch. Yep, so uh, in that screen before that I showed, where I, well, I was trying to show before the net connection died on me, you can get a list of all the builds you've done, oh, okay. and you can see where it broke, and then you can revert that. But it's actually a really good question, though. I'd like to provide some, uh, some graphs per project, which would say how many green builds per day over how many red builds, and you can kind of get a bit of a feeling that maybe you're breaking the builds too much and pushing broken builds, Maybe you need to just be a little bit more aware. I think it's a, an interesting idea, but I, I don't want to provide, we don't want to provide stats that are just for fun. They have to have a real use. Where the money comes from to support current infrastructure? Does Sorry? it sponsorship? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, where, you give, uh, where does money comes from to support infrastructure <coughs> of uh, Travis CI service? I, Does I, this I'm, I'm really sorry, I can barely hear at the moment. Oh, the, oh who's paying for this? Who, who's paying for infrastructure, yeah. Um, uh, the sponsors are paying for everything that is a consumable service. If we need to do hosting, Heroku pays. If we need a worker, Engine Yard, Rails Love, um, uh, Enterprise Rails, they're all paying. When it comes to development and maintaining the community, we are paying ourselves. We don't have people giving us money for that. We are spending our own time. We're actually, a lot of us are taking time off work at the moment to maintain this and to get it to a, a to get it to a point where we don't have to spend heaps and heaps of time to keep it running. Because back in the day, Michael would be taking every 
five minutes off work to restart a VM because we were quite unstable. And we've got a lot better recently, but it's eating into us. So we, we do it ourselves. We do it for the love, and it's everything that Sven was saying. We, we're just doing open source. Uh, oh. One question. Yeah. Uh, have you tried to, or maybe a thought about replacing uh, virtual machines with uh, some kind of lightweight uh, virtualization like electric containers or something like that? We, we've been considering that. The biggest problem is that when you're wanting to do development, we all run Macs and you don't want to then have to change something about your Mac that would make it just work for this. VirtualBox is universal. Uh, EC2 is universal, those cloud things. But I think there's a lot a lot to be said about dedicated machines are going to work really well for the open source community because EC2 and Brightbox and, and all of those different uh, joint, you know, they all cost. And when you say to someone, now the bill's gone up, someone's going to have to pay for that, that's a lot harder to do than if we've just got a box to you. So maybe there is some possibility of us uh, tweaking the environment to make it a bit more efficient. So we're, we're open to look into stuff. Thanks. I think that's everyone. Yep. Um, thank you very much.